uh, Gordon Littman from Israel. I, I think we have to come back to Iona's question as what is the difference between a family doctor and a hospital specialist? And the, the statement made by the, the Danish uh, GP that in the past the GPs weren't doing the job, we give them money and suddenly they do the job. Instead of throwing money at the GPs because they're not doing the job and hopefully they'll start doing the job because we give them more money, should we not be looking at the fundamental problem that we have in general practice today? Why are doctors, with, without getting extra payment, not willing to do the job? That's the main problem. And instead of the government throwing money at the doctors to carry on doing it the same way, I mean, I, I, don't know how much, I don't know how much money they're paying specifically for P, P4P P in, in, uh, in, in the UK, but if they used that money and channeled it into ways that the doctors would wish to change their, the way they work. I know the way we work in Israel, the conditions of work in some places are atrocious. The number of patients we have to see, don't pay more money just so that you will add a few hours. Maybe it's better to bring in a few more doctors. Maybe cut down the list sizes, that's the answer. But we just feel that we, it's, we, we, we're not tackling the main problem. The main problem is the conditions of work, the way doctors have to carry on day after day after day on their own, in their, in their room. But if we pay the money, we're okay and we can forget that for another 10 years. Great. Thank you, Gordon. So you say pay for performance in the pocket of the doctor might have perverse, perverse side effects, but making the context of work a bit more uh, uh, bearable might also have a, an, a huge effect on the motivation, the internal motivation of the doctors. Um, Stephen Campbell from the United Kingdom. I might surprise a few people here, but I'm going to agree with Iona <laughs> for the most part. Uh, and the reason why is because as a quality of care researcher, um, there are two focuses. There's the individual patient and there's the population health. And if you look at the defining quality of care, you look at the individual needs of an individual patient and what's the purest definition of quality of care is an individual patient's encounter with a healthcare system. And it's up to a health professional, and I sometimes encourage GPs to look up the word professional in a dictionary, because they should use their professional intrinsic motivation do the best for that patient. And that's the root of good quality general practice. And the danger is that all the population health measures, which is what things like the COAF are and pay for performance, uh, doesn't deal in individual patients. It can't cope with mess, I like the word mess. It can't cope with comorbidities. It can't cope with different home lifestyles. It can only cope with single conditions. And that cannot reflect the individual complexity. Well, all it can do is population health measures. And the problem, I think, is, I agree with that statement, there's been far too much focus on population health measures and not enough focus on how do we deal with the individual patient. And I think the other point I'd make is about the deficiencies of the quality and outcomes framework isn't necessarily, I'm going to give a lecture here, I'm sorry. The deficiencies of the quality and outcomes framework isn't necessarily the deficiencies of pay for performance. Because the quality and outcomes framework is a deeply appalling example of P for P. <laughs> they were the wrong indicators at the wrong time with too much money attached. They were kept in for too long, so there was stagnation and people knew what to expect. But the big thing is, was 25 to 30 percent of income. So I think if you're going to have P for P, it should be no more than 5 percent. And it's one part of a vast array of quality improvement initiatives that you use. But none of those quality improvement initiatives should be at the uh, expense of the individual patient. And the more I think about P for P, the more I think I want to replace P for P with I for I, investment for improvement. If you know that something's good, 10 minute interval, 15 minute booking interval, 20 minute booking interval, new piece of equipment, a new nurse, invest in that. He's the great assessor of cloth, so. Rob Dijkstra from the Netherlands. I would like to add to the previous uh, speaker that I think we're in a learning phase, in a development phase with pay for performance. Uh, it looks like, uh, you know, these this football teams with the, young, the youngsters playing football. They're all running behind the ball, including the goalkeeper. And, and if you look from outside, you say, oh, that's not proper football. But I think that this is like, like they are. We are in a development phase. I think we, we are learning 
what works with pay for performance and what doesn't work with pay for performance. I think we see an example here you presented that doesn't work, but I think it needs more investigation on the aspect that will work. And I think we also heard some examples, challenging matters, uh, difficult matters that you have to put extra performance for to get it implemented in your uh, practice. So in the search of uh, evidence-based implementation strategies, I think we should not throw pay for performance away, but we should investigate where it is worthful and where it is not. Thank you. Anybody else? Yeah, Tricia. I'm, I think I'm very nearly as opposed to the COF as, and pay for performance in general as Iona, but I just want to throw in a suggestion. Um, I, I'm, I'm interested that very few people, although some have, but, but many people haven't engaged with some of the philosophical um, arguments that Iona has put forward and, and have kind of continued with a set of assumptions which, which actually rejects that philosophy implicitly. Um, but to those who do have engaged with that philosophy and share it, I, w I want to, to speak to those and say, does that mean, do, do those things that, that really represent what we went into general practice for and what we currently do and, and value, do they mean that we should have no pay for performance whatsoever? Or is the problem with the quaff, the fact that it is so totally strangulating of almost every encounter that we have. Um, and I have a patient come in and sits down, and as soon as the patient sits down, the screen of the computer is facing the patient, and up pops, quaff. You haven't made them fill out a depression questionnaire or something which is completely irrelevant to what the patient is after right now. Um, and that disruptive technology um, disrupts most of my consultations. Now, supposing we focused on a very tiny uh, number of things, supposing we just focused on treating blood pressure, um, I'm not sure. The one bit I'm worried about that, that I think I disagree with I only on is this business that pay for performance wouldn't improve the management of blood pressure. It's the most cost-effective thing we can do in general practice is find and treat people with high blood pressure. It's very simple. And to have a pop-up pop prompt to say the patient hasn't had their blood pressure taken in the last two years or if you took it and you just kept it in the back of your head, sorry, that's not good enough anymore. I just wonder if we might salvage something from, from an approach which I think is generally as destructive as Iona has made it. Thank you. Okay, uh, I'm Isabel Santos, I'm from Portugal. Okay, we are in a very, very bad mood in Portugal. But uh, to be pro <laughs> or against is not only a question of philosophy, it's a question of results. Saying it in another way, what is the ultimate goal of our profession and of our consultations? To save lives? Do we save more lives because we work, uh, pay for performance? Do we postpone more complications of diseases because we are being paid by, for performance? I think that we don't have enough data now for uh, 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 saying that. So what is the ultimate consultation of our consultations is to care for persons. And most of the care we are uh, um, uh, making in our consultations are, cannot be paid by, by this system of paying for performance. So I'm pro Yona. <laughs> one follower, Zekaria. There are so beautiful comments, but I would like to add one more. Uh, this is Zekeria from Turkey. Uh, I agree with both speakers. <laughs> they both made <laughs> very well. Ah, great! <laughs> Beautiful comments uh, and uh, really good ideas. Uh, but uh, I think, my, to my opinion, there is one point which we should not omit here, which is professionalism and the boundness of the GP to the ethical values and to his work. Uh, if this is not there, whatever the system is, if it, whether it is P4P or not, uh, it will fail. 
So, to my opinion, we should stress more on the tra training of the GP from the family up to the professional life, and uh, he should be bound to the professional values more than to his pocket. Otherwise, whatever the system, it will not work. We had in Turkey uh, in the recent past uh, a salary-based payment, and now in the hospital they are paying for performance. I witnessed both. If it is salary-based, the GP is looking how to escape and not to work. If it is P4P, then if it is not bound to the values, he will ask for extra tests to, uh, to raise the threshold. Thank you. Fred Wilson from Denmark. I think we should broaden the discussion a little bit because what is it about? All of us like to earn money. To earn money, you should be a good merchant. All of us like to be professional. And to be professional, you should have values. And what is the problem is that there have come a tendency that the merchant come before the doctor. And we should take care of that all over in the healthcare system. If we could work with values and keep the doctor before the merchant, I have no problems with payment. Whether it's payment for performance or it's payment based on fee for service or what it is. And I think there's two situations when we talk about the merchant. In UK, you didn't have any fee for service or nearly no fee for service. And it was a shock for you to get paid for performance. In many other countries, like my country, Denmark, we have a huge fee for service. And we know there is a lot of distortions from fee for service. And maybe it were better to cut down a little bit of the fee for service and pay for performance in that sense. But still, the real thing is that the doctor should come before the merchant. And if the doctor doesn't come before the merchant, then we have a problem. And let me broaden it into part two, if it's okay, because this is not a GP issue. The real issue in healthcare system over the last 20 years is that we have become very occupied by incentives, economic incentives. We have di diagnostic related groups in the, health, in the hospitals. They are distorting the system, seriously. We have got private hospitals, they are good, but they are distorting the system because the doctors in the private hospitals, they can't keep to morale and private and good professional standards. They'd run for the economic incentives. So all over in the system, we have built a lot of economic incentives and we've forgot to talk about the values and the doctor. And what I would urge for is that in future, cut down the number of discussions on money but if we have to use money, let us use them in an intelligent way, but raise the discussion of professional values, what it says to be a good doctor, whether you are in a hospital or whether you are in general practice. Yeah.